Hello. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Ramey Myers, and I'm the product manager for the ArcGIS Utility Network. And today, I'd like to cover the utility network and give you an introduction to the ArcGIS Utility Network for all industries. So, some topics that we'll be covering in this session is an introduction to the utility network, an overview of the, the utility network with the new license model, architecture rules, and a little bit of insight into network management and trace configuration. And I'd like to explore multiple utility networks integrated for a smart city utilization and see a couple of ways that I, that I would use it or I could use it uh, in, my, in my previous role in economic development or business development. So let's dive in. So one of the, the most interesting things that has happened in the last 10 years is the changing pattern of utilities. So regardless of commodity, whether it's electric communication or gas or water, renewables plays a big part in all utilities. Whether it's solar for uh, instrument collection or whether it's um, battery storage or, or wind uh, or even uh, microgeneration. All of the aspects of renewables have come into play, especially for smart city environments. Additionally, the information uh, platform for utilities has significantly transferred to the mobile environment. That mobile landscape, uh, the ability to be able to take a map or an app out to the field in a phone or in a tablet has really enriched the user experience for engineers and field crews. And then the depth and richness of information has exploded tremendously because of the development of IoT, uh, sensors and SCADA devices. Once again, across every utility have become critical in terms of reliability, in terms of customer support, and in terms of asset management. And that customer choice is critical. You know, the, the days of, you know, this regional competition for business growth, those days are gone. And now cities and municipalities and utilities are faced with a global comp competitive market for new customers and new load. And at the same time, that information, the support, that global competition has become richer and denser and uh, you know more pervasive, it's also played a critical part in utility compliance and understanding the details of a network from a reliability perspective or examining what a risk to customers or risk to reliability. That's a critical role in today's modern utility. So as a result, we see richer and deeper analytics for all of our users. It's really important that we have better and more informative analytics, but still maintain that sharp user focus, uh, regardless of who that consumer is. So what we're seeing is, regardless of industry, the load balancing, the, the information knowledge of monetizing and incentivizing load growth across communities, municipalities, and regions has become more critical. But at the end of the day, our utilities still have the same core drivers that they always have. For utility, safety always comes first. Safety first is a mantra that's repeated across the globe and across every utility. And it's important to have that geospatial awareness of your assets, of your customers, to be able to address challenges that may impact safety. 
customers are important, not only in terms of giving them the best information to make decisions, but also providing them with the best experience in terms of costs and reliability. Asset management has become critical for utilities. O&M budgets, operation and maintenance budgets are so constrained right now that they are truly challenged to look for opportunities and develop ways to improve and reduce costs to their budgets and finances. Grid modernization. Systems are increasing in terms of technology and increasing in terms of complexity. What used to be regional uh, generation um, facilities are now distributed. What used to be, um, you know, simple reservoir to market water systems are now much more complicated. And the development and the, the implementation of smart devices such as SCADA and AMI has truly increased the complexities of grid modernization. And innovation is just a part of our daily lives, not only in terms of software, but also in terms of hardware and data collection and analysis. You know, just 10 years ago, the thought of data collection via drones was, it was unthinkable that the regulations were, were not there uh, in place for commercial application of drone technology. But now that's a solid part. It's an integrated part of utility data collection. And as a result of all that information, we've provided the utility network as a foundation, a spatial foundation to be able to support assets, to be able to respond to customer engagement and provide operational insights for that global digital integration for utilities to truly give everyone a deeper and better experience um, beyond the traditional uh, GIS user base. Now, what's interesting to me is if you put that utility network in the, in the center as the core framework for all these solutions, you could see how utilities could utilize the entire enterprise to support those core drivers of a utility, whether it's parcel fabric or a hub or analytics for IoT or networks or drone to map or tracker. Every part of the enterprise can be optimized and utilized to help you improve your information systems. And I love this graphic, but there's an even better one. If you consider all these apps in terms of a constellation as they support these core drivers, you could see that these apps don't stand alone. The days of silo data are long gone. And they're replaced with these integrated systems that cross business platforms, cross business development teams, and enable utilities to maximize that return on investment for their entire organization. So let's go ahead and take a look at the ArcGIS Utility Network architecture and rules. And the foundation of the utility network lies in the domains. So operational commodities such as electricity or communications or gas or water are all expressed as utility network domains. Now, we can parse out the domains based upon their business function. So we call those tiers. So some utilities could have a partition or a sequential tier such as electric or telco. Others have a nested tier. We call that hierarchical networks. And they could be like gathering zones or pressure zones or, or storage or uh, district network or, or service pipes. And all of these different tiers have 
different schemas, different business drivers. So that's what the tiers enable us to do is to cluster this information at the network level and be able to apply uh, certain characteristics of the feeders or circuits based upon the business. Now, we also have a structural domain and the structural domain uh, is in every utility network and supports any of the operational domains. For example, uh, you may have multiple operational domains in a given utility network. Well, you'll still just have one structured domain. And that structural domain uh, supports any um, structural uh, facilities or pieces of equipment that uh, can impact reliability or impact the assets of the operational commodity. So for points or junctions, we can have poles or manholes or bolts or frames. For linear assets, we can have ducts or trenches or guys or shield wire, mechanical cable uh, to support the structure. Or we can have boundaries such as pump houses or substations or maintenance areas. So it truly depends upon the configuration of the organization. Now, these tiers, these operational tiers, I'm going to talk a little bit about operational tiers first. They have specific feature layers, and they all have connectivity. So the first feature layer I'd like to discuss is a, is a device. So devices represent operational features. They have action. They can open or close or represent transformers, controllers, such as switches, valves, transformers, or pumps. And then we have junctions. So junctions represent non-operational connection points, still connected, but they don't have the ability to open or close. They don't have the ability to regulate flow or meter flow. Assemblies are a collection of devices and junctions that do a specific business um, you know, at a given location. And then lines represent linear connective assets such as wires or pipes. So for each tier, we also have an element, a layer called the subnetwork, and it's a linear asset, but it represents the operational properties of all of the features within a single feeder or circuit. So we call that a subnetwork. Now, to enrich those layers, we provide asset groups. And asset groups are a subtype that gives you a general description of the elements of the feature. So for devices, asset groups could be switches or valves or transformers or pumps. For connections, it could be, or for junctions, it could be connection points. For assemblies, it could be transformer banks or pump assemblies. For lines, it could be medium voltage, low voltage, high pressure, low pressure. So general descriptions. Now, we've also got asset types that provide a, a specific description that appends to the asset group. So for every device feature layer, I might have asset group switch, asset type, three phase disconnect. Might have asset group valve, asset type one way. So this enables us to have a really rich array of um, features or assets that participate in the utility network. Now, a new functionality that's just going to be released this summer is non-spatial objects. And this is something that we're really excited about. So non-spatial objects or uh, junctions or edges and junctions represent um, non-spatial elements that represent point features, or edges represent non-spatial elements that support linear features. Uh, so these non-spatial records in the table have full connectivity. They have full capability to have structural or containment associations. 
and they participate fully in subnetworks and traces. So these non-spatial objects are basically records without geometry that fully participate in the network topology. Really, really exciting technology, and we'll take a look at that shortly. So you can, you're not limited in the non-spatial objects, you can add additional fields to help represent those object attributes. Um, you can even include network attributes or network categories to enrich those non-spatial elements. Um, it's going to enable a higher resolution model uh, for communication. So for example, you may have a fiber cable it has individual buffer tubes and fiber strands. And those buffer tubes and fiber strands can be represented as non-spatial. So you can have that higher degree of cardinality. You can um, leverage the full extent of these non-spatial elements as part of the validation and the network topology. And you can also add non-spatial features via attribute rules or um, user experience from related features. So let's go ahead and take a look at connectivity rules. There's three types of connectivity rules. First is a junction edge rule. And junction edges enable us to connect point feature, junction, to a linear feature, an edge. And that junction could uh, is uh, defined by both its asset group and asset type. Same thing with the edge, asset group, asset type. So it gives us a high degree of regulation to make sure that our data has the highest quality and the uh, most rigor uh, for um, editing and validation. Uh, the second connective rule type is junction-junction rule. So this enables us to offset point features and still have connective flow between those offset features. So I can have assets in a substation and not incur the cost of building the line connectors. I can use a connective association. Junction, junction rule type. And then the last type is an edge, junction, edge rule type. So this enables us to, to traverse, for example, um, in the, on the slide, to traverse from an above ground asset to a below ground asset through a junction. That junction could be a riser or um, some sort of uh, changing tap or a uh, meter uh, location that transforms the, um, you know, transposes the uh, asset from above ground to below ground or, or conversely. Uh, the next rule is containment rule. So this enables us to have simple representation at scale and then dive in and see the deep internals of our infrastructure, such as this pumping station. Now, what's really interesting is in this pumping station, I also have junction-junction rules to offset my features but still build connectivity flow through those devices. And then the final network rule is called a structural rule. So the structural rule enables me to associate structural features such as poles or manholes or, or ducts or trenches to the subnetwork properties of a circuit or a feeder. Um, so it gives us that, that capability of being able to run an ad hoc trace and returning back my structural elements of the network. So in addition to network rules to attain a higher level of data quality, we also have attribute rules. So attribute rules are exciting. First type of attribute rule is a calculation rule. So if I add this transformer into a medium voltage line, I could build a calculation rule that says that I want to update the transformer ID with the properties of the line ID plus the transformer ID to give me a new transformer ID of MV1001. The next type of rule 
is a constraint rule. So for example, if I try to put a 15 PSI valve on a 10 PSI pipe, the attribute rule lets that edit occur. But if I try to put a valve that's underrated for the pipe, it'll reject that edit. And then the final type of attribute rule is a validation rule. So use a validation rule where you can create an edit that doesn't meet the validation standard, but you can initially run the edit. It's expected that you'll go back in and change the value when you run validate on that network element. If the value of the point feature um, is appropriate for the value of the pipe, the edit will succeed, and if it's not, it will be rejected. So that is the um, utility network architecture, network rules, and attribute rules. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the new user type license model. Prior to the release of 10.8, to access a utility network, you needed a user type to access that multi-user environment, an enterprise license to host the utility network in the utility network server extension. Now, with the release of 10.8, we've moved that server extension license into a user type extension. So now users are providing uh, that, that increased level of identity security um, in addition to uh, accessibility of the network server. So let's see what that means in terms of uh, what happens if you don't have a utility network license extension. So for user types without a user type extension, they could still view, query, or select network features in a utility network. They can view associations to include connectivity, containment, and structure association via attributes. And then the runtime 100.8 associations can now be viewed without the extension. Now, if you do have a utility network for a viewer with a utility network add-on license, they can now perform traces and display stored network diagrams. For editors and field workers, they can validate sub or validate their networks, update their subnetworks. They can uh, change or modify uh, terminals or uh, associations. They can even uh, edit, save, or uh, upload network diagrams. Now for the creator and GIS professional, uh, they could do everything. They can publish to a network. They can uh, administer um, utility network properties and configurations. Now, the exception here is the ArcGIS Professional add-on basic. That's, that's a little bit different. Let's go ahead and take a look at a, at a functionality matrix and we'll walk through this. So for individuals without a utility network extension, they could still view features that participate in the utility network. They can view connectivity, containment, structure associations. For viewers and users with a professional basic, ArcGIS uh, user type professional basic with a, with a utility network extension, they can also trace the network, they can view subnetwork, they can view diagrams. Now, editors and field workers with the utility network extension can update the subnetwork, they can validate the network topology, they can modify connective containment and structural associations, modify terminal paths, set terminal connections, edit the network diagram or save and store the network diagram. And for users with the uh, creator user type and the utility network extension or uh, ArcGIS professional users, standard or advanced, they can do everything. They can administer 
utility network configurations or publish the utility network. So let's see how you get access to the utility network. So moving to Enterprise 10.8 or beyond, for every four core utility network management extension, you'll now receive 50 utility network user type extensions. For each ArcGIS desktop license that's active, it includes one utility network user type extension. Now this includes the basic desktop. Now let's pause a minute uh, for this um, ArcGIS desktop license or the uh, transition from a four core server to user type extensions. Both of these scenarios, the user type extensions get provisioned to the portal. So you reach out to your sales rep, you'll get a license and file, publish it up to your portal, and you'll get these user type extensions that you assign to your users. Now the difference lies when you purchase a professional user type, standard or advanced. When you do that, you get the utility network user type extension baked in to that license. So you get it included in that license. Now, unfortunately, you can't provision it out to someone else. It stays with that professional user type license. Now, the other way to get it is to purchase a utility network user type extension. So that's the new user type license for ArcGIS Utility Network at 10.8 and beyond. Let's take a look at subnetwork management tracing and diagrams. So for subnetwork management, you have the opportunity to configure your uh, utility network as either a radial configuration uh, with a single flow of direction from a single source down to your customers or a mesh configuration where you can have uh, indeterminate areas of flow direction, multiple sources. Additionally, you can define this network as a network that flows from a uh, top end source down to the customer or flows from the customers down to a sink, uh, which would be a controller, like a reservoir. And then having those network configurations, now you've got a great amount of flexibility in terms of configuring traces and running traces and uh, setting up your uh, network properties. And additionally, you can take the results of those traces or take the results of uh, a map configuration and represent that data as a network diagram. So let's take a look at how that works. So let's th walk through a smart city configuration. So I've got a facility that um, it's in a congested urban area and there's no real room for growth. So they're going to uh, upgrade or modernize uh, this facility. So one of the first challenges we have is to look at the resources and determine what's the opportunity or can we can we upgrade with the infrastructure we have or do we have to uh, uh, switch over to a different um, you know circuit or feeder uh, to support this new infrastructure so I just ran a trace on my my water network and I can um, pull out and see that I'm supporting Supporting my my water um, from this reservoir to the uh, the east of my location, so that looks good. Uh, the next thing we'll do is uh, we'll explore how our electric network uh, is supported from within the building. And right here, you know, it looks like I've I've got a pretty robust. Uh, infrastructure inside this building footprint, but it's really hard for me to ascertain from a do t uh, 2D perspective. So if we look at this from 3D, we can actually go inside the building 
and I can run a circuit trace uh, from a given floor um, so we could see, come here, so we could see uh, a selected circuit from within the building and trace that all the way from the building to the supporting substation and see all the infrastructure, see the relationships, see th how things come together uh, to support my network infrastructure. So I'll go ahead and zoom in here and you could see that the trace from within my building um, highlights or, or showcases the uh, breaker uh, in this substation. Now, what's really interesting is, um, you know, in my former role in Southern Company, I was really limited in terms of the geographic region or capability of uh, my 3D networks. And I've got a uh, full smart city model here. You know, I can go in and I could see um, the impact of solar generation uh, on, you know, some of my regional development. And you'll see I've got some buildings, um, you know, throughout throughout my model that are representing different uh, community areas that are being developed. But I've also got a large number of substations. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this substation here. And this one's really interesting because I use this substation to model some network underground. So... I'll go to this diagram of a substation and, um, you know, we'll take a look at a breaker here that's feeding my network. Um, so we'll go ahead and select the breaker and we'll go into uh, the network and I can pull out of my substation and I can not only see the electrical circuits, but if we take a look at the, you know, the infrastructure, we can also see the, um, you know, how gas infrastructure is uh, tied into my electric network. So it's not just a single electric network, it's all integrated uh, through my systems. And what's really interesting for me is as I explore uh, a feature like a duct bank, I can see the multiple circuits that are embedded in the duct bank, and I can even dive into um, the individual uh, circuitry uh, that's in, you know, the respective uh, duct facility. Now, what's also interesting in this uh, network model is, I, you know, as I mentioned, I don't just have electricity in my, my models. I actually model my communication network as well. So for every uh, electrical meter, I've got an AMI with a telecommunication signal that goes back uh, to my telecommunication network and runs all the way back to my headquarters facility. So this is how it could be deployed using an entirely spatial network. But what happens if I utilize uh, the non-spatial capability of the utility network? So with the release of 10.8.1, uh, we've got non-spatial features that could be integrated in our network. So, for example, I've got in this butterfly diagram, I've got a duck selected. And I can go in and see the relationship all the way down because I'm using non-spatial features to represent not only the duck, but the conductor of the duck. So I don't have the cost of building uh, geometries to support this. I'm actually... Um, using non-spatial features to represent a large number of the elements um, of this network. Um, 
Now, how do you create non-spatial features? Well, we're certainly working on user experiences to uh, create, um, you know, through the editing template. But I also have a um, a attribute rule that enables me to uh, create a um, the the individual phases off of the transformer uh, for this element. So um, I'll go ahead and just assign this feature to uh, Redland ZSRI, and as I drop this transformer, we'll be able to see in the attribute that I not only dropped the transformer, but I also, using an attribute rule, I also propagated individual non-spatial records for each phase. So the utility network capabilities uh, reaches out to all industries and reaches out to all scales. We think with the non-spatial elements that you will be able to uh, define and uh, project your spatial features uh, beyond, um, you know, network model capabilities uh, previously before. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions and we hope that you enjoy the virtual UC experience. The utility network is well suited for trends and patterns of any utility, either complex networks or simple networks such as this one. This map shows the uh, transmission network of electric and gas across the U.S. And while it covers a large geographic region, it's in fact a very simplistic representation of the interstate transmission gas lines and uh, transmission, transmission electrical grid. So what I'm doing now is I'm running a trace to see the, um, the transmission support for gas into these given gas turbines and uh, results of my trace shows the uh, the pipeline that supports those combined cycle plants. So the, the capability of a utility network varies based upon your business drivers, whether it's simple or complex, uh, small municipalities or large geographic regions. The utility network is capable of providing you uh, deep insights and in spatial analytics and integrating with your business intelligence platforms uh, for all your systems. So that wraps up my presentation on the utility network for all industries. I think it's interesting to see how uh, the network capabilities can uh, be built out on multiple utility networks and work in conjunction with each other, or multiple utility networks can be, or multiple domains could be built into a single utility network and integrated with each other across the structural domain. I would like to take a moment to thank SBS for uh, passing on those really cool uh, substation transformers, circuit breakers, and equipment. Um, definitely, I would reach out to them if you've got any questions about uh, 3D integration for uh, electric transmission or electric distribution uh, elements. Um, and I really hope to hear from you in terms of uh, where do you think the utility network will go as we start building out these smart city integrations. I, I definitely uh, anticipate some really interesting models coming out with the release of non-spatial capabilities. I uh, anticipate some really interesting um, demonstrations of the technology as we see more uh, smart cities coming online with the utility network. Mm -hmm.